Good evening, everybody. That's much better. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> what are you staring at? That is something that's inside every one of your cells. You have millions of them. Millions in each cell. This is the world's smallest motor. It's an electric motor, but it doesn't run electrons. It runs on protons, hydrogen ions. It takes an incredibly uh, fragile molecule called adenosine diphosphate and joins it to another phosphate to make an incredibly, incredibly fragile molecule called adenosine triphosphate. A warm little pond cannot possibly produce something like this. And let alone that, it can't even produce the adenosine or the adenosine monophosphate or the adenosine diphosphate. And phosphate in nature, if it touches any metal ion, it forms an insoluble salt and precipitates out of solution. Which is why phosphate mining across the world is so incredibly important for farmers. Because phosphate disappears and gets locked up and implants die. So our bodies use an incredibly ridiculous system for producing energy. That's the thing that makes energy. I have too much of it, apparently. <laughs> but I'm going to take a little detour here because I want to talk about what we've been doing all day outside. There's a machine out there on a table. That machine measures the angle to the sun up and the angle around from north to the sun. It's called the azimuth and the altitude. Well, I got on the NOAA website today, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Associ Administration, and I opened up their solar position calculator. I typed in the latitude and longitude of this location, and I adjusted the time. I said, okay, give me the sun's position at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, all day long. And this is the results I got. So in red, that's the angle from north. You can see it, it, it speeds up a little bit and slows down and speeds up again. And in blue, that's the angle above the horizon of the sun. It gets up to about 52 degrees above the horizon. That's your latitude. In June, on June 21st. Oh, by the way, um, how many of you light-skinned European types got a nice sunburn today? We're two months away from the maximum height of the sun in the sky in the middle of June. Well, two months after that is August. This is the sun of August. And you thought it was still winter. Just saying. I hope you can sleep tonight. And I, got, I got roasted too, but not as bad as some of you. Oh, boy. Okay, so now we're learning about the sun in science. That is a mathematical model based on the assumption that the earth is a sphere and the sun goes around the earth. The flat earth community believes basically that Noah is the heart of the beast. And they do nothing but lie. That is the model. Now, a flat earth model would look nothing like that. The earth is flat. The sun circles above the sky. It never touches the horizon. And yet, it starts off on the left, on the horizon, on, on the right, on the horizon. Okay. Now, this is our data sheet. How many of you participated in this? How many of you took a measurement? Okay, look around, everybody. Ready? Let's take a vote. Let's vote on, um, I did half of these measurements, everyone else did the rest. Let's take a vote. How well do you think we did? Who's, there's three, three options. Terribly. Our dots are going to be all over the place, have nothing to do with that. That's option one. Option two is pretty good, but our dots would be like, but follow the line, kind of. And the third option is we nailed it. Using this medieval torture device out there. Okay. Let's vote. Everyone, you have to vote. You have to pick one of those three. It's going to go in order. Who thinks terribly there's no relation between our data points and that? Raise your hands. Okay. Okay. Someone who has no confidence in me. Two people, no confidence in me. Okay. How about option B? Kind of following the line, but the points should be all over the place. Oh, okay. Now, how many of you actually think we did it correctly and our points are going to follow the line? Are you kidding me? Wow, you're very confident people. <laughs> because I didn't expect that. I didn't think that machine was going to be accurate. Here are our results. Okay. 
My friends, welcome to science. Also, if someone wants to claim that the earth is flat, they have to call all those people who had their hands up liars. And all of you who witnessed this, we did a public social experiment. If you'd like to take a photograph of the data sheet and put it in Excel and do your own calculations, it's there. Anyone can access it. Now, I'm not talking about this tonight. That's Monday morning. The shape of the earth is really important and it's really fun. And it gets really esoteric. But we nailed it because the earth actually is a sphere and the sun really does go around the earth. And there is no conspiracy. Okay. Now, we're going to get into the high-tech cell. I'm going to, of course, promote Creation Magazine because it's a very critical thing in my life. I think I'm a Christian because of Creation Magazine. I mean, I was a freshman, maybe a sophomore at Georgia Tech. I was a complete total nerd, sold out to science. I would have said evolution's a fact, millions of years is true. And I went to hear this creation speaker at a church in Atlanta. And he was saying that the earth isn't millions of years old and evolution isn't true. And I thought that man was crazy. I am now that man. But I went back to my dorm room with a copy of Creation Magazine. And there was an article in there about something I learned in my evolutionary biology class the day before. And I had no idea it could be answered biblically. And there's another article in that, in that edition that had a, uh, something about geology that I always wondered about. And it answered it biblically. And I was shocked. And I think this is the tool that God used to study me into Christianity. Now, I understand we walk by faith. I understand that clearly. But I'm a nerd. And I ask questions. And I don't like when I have a question that can't be answered or that seems to conflict. When I find an answer that conflicts, I go and try to figure it out. And if Christianity and the Bible wasn't true, I shouldn't have gone down this path. I should have proven the Bible wasn't true, and yet here I am. Uh, we also have our, our website. For people who haven't been here before, just give me a second here. Our website, creation.com. There's flatter stuff's on the website. Uh, there's high-tech sell stuff's on the website. All the stuff we talk about on, on our, on this week is on that website in video form, in podcast form, in, um, in, in article form. We're on all the social media sites you can imagine. We're we have a place everywhere we can possibly get ourselves. Okay, that's the introduction to our ministry. Let's get into the meat of what we're talking about tonight. We're going to be talking about what's inside the cell. We'll talk a little bit about DNA, which as far as I'm concerned is the most complex information storage mechanism in the known universe. That's my definition of DNA. But we're going to talk a lot about more than just DNA because there's a lot of amazing things in our cells. But I want to continue, uh, consider something we showed this morning. Just talk about it again very briefly. This is a photograph of the human genome. You have chromosomes in your cell made of DNA. And when your cells divide, those chromosomes condense. You can put a stain in the, in the, under a microscope slide and you can see them in a microscope. You can cut them out and line them up. And that is your genome. Well, actually, that's a man's genome because there's a Y chromosome on the bottom right. Ladies, you have two X chromosomes. And as I said earlier, you have six feet of DNA in every one of your little microscopic cells. That tells us already God's a genius, right? Okay. Now, when they went to sequence the human genome, it took them 13 years and $3 billion. That's a dollar a letter. And the data wasn't that good. There was gaps, there were mistakes. It, it, was, it was awkward, but that was it. Uh, today, I had to update, I should say, millions of human genomes are now available for public consumption. And uh, the $1,000 genome is already passed. I mean, I had my genome sequence for $125. That's how fast technology has advanced. From a billion dollars or $3 billion to less than $300 in about 20 years. They're now inventing machines that can sequence DNA on the fly. So you could put one in like a bus or a subway or a school, and as our DNA is just floating through the air, it'll suck it in and sequence it. That will you allow them to detect viruses, bacteria, or individual people. Now, if you think you're safe because maybe you haven't participated in Ancestry.com or 23andMe.com, no, 
All you need is a second cousin that can positively identify you from any DNA sample. And as soon as there are about a million people involved in some public project, and there are more than that already, um, you can be identified specifically, individually, unless you have a twin, using probably, it probably cost a dollar, because you don't have to sequence whole genome, you only have to look at a couple letters. Now, this genome of ours, it controls things like biochemistry. You ever studied biochemistry? I love it. <laughs> but there's no end to it. It's really complicated. It goes on forever. We have all these crazy chemicals in our bodies. Chemicals that make a, a, a um, synthetic chemist drool because they can't make them. They can get them from biology, but they actually can't make them in a the laboratory because it's too complicated. And these molecules are transformed into other molecules using enzymes, using proteins. Your body produces protein to take one improbable molecule and turn it into another improbable molecule. And, but it acts like scissors, like a scalpel. It can literally, you have enzymes that can move one atom off or onto a molecule. We can't do that in a laboratory or even in a factory. We do dirty, bulk, mass action chemistry. You throw a bunch of stuff in there and you let it react and then you try to purify what's left and keep the non-purified stuff out because you use that stuff as toxins. And you just got to pull out the molecule you want. It's really expensive and really hard. But biology does amazing things. And all that amazement argues against evolution. Think how delicately balanced the system is. One mutation and one letter of one protein and you're dead or deformed. Now, some of them can withstand a, a mutation, but usually a protein has an active site and that can hardly be changed. And if that can hardly be changed, how does it evolve? You know what a genome is, right? That's all your DNA. There's other ohms out there. There's the proteome, that's all your proteins. And there's the interactome, that's all the interactions amongst all the proteins in your body. This is a map of the interactome of a fruit fly. But only about one third of the proteins that they, they mapped are shown because they wouldn't be able to show them all, that'd be too much. But what this is is, in green, the proteins that are inside the cell nucleus. In blue, the proteins that are inside the cytoplasm. And yellow are the, uh, the membrane brown proteins and the extracellular proteins. And you can see there's a cutout here and a zoom up, and another cutout and a zoom up. Each one of these dots is a protein. Can you see the lines connecting them? Well, this one in the middle, I can count one, two, three, four, five, six. Looks like seven or eight lines connecting to other proteins. But one of my connections, I mean interactions like this. Let's say that this is a protein. There's eight other proteins that interact with this, but one of them comes and grabs onto it and hides the button so it can't work. One of them comes and pulls out the little dongle and shoves it into my computer. Another one comes and turns it on and off. Another one comes and pushes one of the buttons. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about a lock with multiple keys. What? And if you change those keys, you can't open the lock, or you break the lock, or it gets stuck in the off position, or it gets stuck in the on position, and then you die. Some of these things can be changed. You break one of these things, maybe there's an alternate biochemical pathway that can get to the same result. Fine, but it's very inefficient. Our systems are designed to withstand lots of abuse. That's a mark of a good engineer, by the way. Our bodies are robust. We can, I mean, as we age and get older and older and older, we're picking up more and more mutations. More and more things are breaking in our bodies, and yet we still keep going until we finally give up. But it's amazing. We can last for 80, 90 years. That's crazy. I could not make a machine or a robot that lasts for 80 or 90 years. There's no way. And yet our bodies do this all the time when we don't get hit by a bus or eaten by a bear or something, you know. But 
if you can't change most of those connections in a fruit fly, how did the fruit fly evolve? And if you can't change it, how does it keep on evolving? And the human interactome is at least 10 times more complicated than that of a fruit fly. So I submit this to you. Once you have living things, those living things can change. That's Monday night's talk. Once you have living things, they can be modified. They can be tweaked. Mutations can happen and change the skin color, the hair color, the eye color, the height, the weight. Fine. But those changes don't explain how the thing came into existence in the first place. And that's one of the keys to the evolution creation debate. Everyone says, yeah, things can change, fine. But Mr. Evolutionist, the types of changes we see are not sufficient to explain your theory. They fit beautifully into the creationist ideas. Beautifully. Everything that Charles Darwin wrote, the origin of species, I'm like, yep, yep, mm mm-hmm, yep, sure, okay, fine. And after about 150 pages or something, he goes, I can see no limit to the amount of change that natural selection can produce. Oh, you can see no limit. You mean in your imagination? Yeah, in his imagination. There was actually no mechanism to do it. You right so far? All right. I submit to you that the genome is not simple. It is the most complex computer operating system in existence. But it's not static. It actually operates in four dimensions. Four dimensions. What does that mean? You remember in math class, a point has no dimensions, right? A point has no height, width, or length. But a line has one dimension, length. Remember that? Okay, a plane has two dimensions, length and width. You tracking with me? What what grade was this? Seventh grade, eighth grade? A long time ago for some of you. (laughs) But a cube has length, width, and height. Those are the three spatial dimensions. What's the fourth dimension? Time. Your genome operates on all four of those dimensions. Let's go through them one at a time. One, the first dimension is the linear string of letters. I said you have six feet of DNA in every cell, but it's only a few nanometers thick. It is literally a line. It has almost no thickness and is six feet long. That's crazy. But if you look at that information, like here, the beginning of the Y chromosome. Man, that's boring. And it's highly repetitive. T C C C T C C C T C T C C T C C T T C C T. I just picked a spot in the middle there. It's highly repetitive, super boring, and the human brain cannot cannot grasp this type of information. You could try to read through the genome. It's only three billion letters, only take you, you know, thirty years or something like that, but you just go insane if you tried. But let's change this up. Let's say a different way to visualize this. Let's replace each of those letters with a dot. And we'll color them. A, C, G, and T become yellow, uh, green, red, blue, and yellow. I don't remember the four colors are, but here they come. Same exact information in color. And your brain instantly picks up patterns, doesn't it? Yeah, why? Because we're pattern recognition machines. And the human brain is shockingly good at it. Can you see this pattern right here? It's a repeat. The repeat is this long. And then the next line is the same repeat. And every once in a while, there's a break in the repeat because there's a little deletion. And all of a sudden, it stutters, and it goes a little bit. That's very typical in high repetitive DNA. And what's this big gray spot? That's a place in the genome that the original Human Genome Project couldn't sequence. They left 50,000 letters, 100,000 letters, 10,000 letters, big gaps, because they said, okay, we know that there's something in there, but we can't sequence it because... It's too repetitive, and the sequencing machines only sequence that at that time about 300 letters at a time. So you find 300 letters, where does it go in this repeat? It could fit here, 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 here. You don't know. Just like um, you get in your car, and you turn the radio on, and your favorite song is playing. And you start singing along, and all of a sudden, oh, whoops, you realize it's the end of the song, or the middle of the song, and you start singing the wrong verse. Right? Because your sample wasn't long enough to know where you belong in the song, and the song has a lot of repetition in it. Same thing here. 
The early machines cannot do this. Now, last summer, 21 years after the human genome was complete, they finally finished the human genome. And very soon they came out the chimpanzee, the gorilla, the orangutan, and a, and a monkey within months. So we now have, for the first time ever, complete genomes. But, but look, down here, there's a different repeat of a different length. There is high order information in the genome. We don't know what this stuff is for. The evolutionists have consistently just called this junk. Wait. Let's look at the second dimension of the genome. And what's that? It's the long distance DNA interactions. You have um, this piece of DNA makes a protein that comes over here and turns something on or turns something off. The classic example is a sugar digesting system in E. coli. It's called the lac operon. Lac is for lactose. When there's glucose, sugar, in the medium, uh, the bacteria doesn't try to digest lactose, milk, milk sugar, because it's energy inefficient. But if there's no glucose and there's lactose present, the bacteria is like, well, why don't I just go eat that lactose? It's right there. So it turns on this whole suite of genes. There's actually three of them in a row, lac-Z, lac-Y, and lac-A. There's some things above the gene at the beginning of it that tell it whether it can turn on or off. There's a repressor protein. If glucose is around, the cell makes a repressor protein so the lac genes don't turn on. If there's no glucose, that is gone and a... a a cat protein is produced that'll stick here, then RNA polymerase can zip down the thing and manufacture this proteins so that it can digest lactose. You understand? This is an easy example. <laughs> this was figured out in the 60s. And because it was figured out in the 60s, the evolutionists came up with this thing called, actually from the 40s, the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. You have a protein, a protein gene makes a protein. And life seems so simple. And the rest of the 98% of our genomes that don't go for protein, they're just junk. And that was a ruling paradigm for about 30 years. It was always wrong, and they always knew it. But they fought tooth and nail, and even now they're still fighting to resist any evidence of function in that junk DNA stuff. But if you were to map out for the human genome... The second dimension, you'd have to write all the DNA in lines and then draw arrows from one place to another where one part of a DNA interacts with another part. In fact, if you wanted to do that, you'd see nothing but red arrows. There'd be so many interactions. That's the second dimension. See that? You have to do it in an XY plane, height and width, to draw it out. Do you get that, why that's two-dimensional? Okay. Oh, there's more. MicroRNA. <laughs> oh, junk DNA. Not junk. These are all these small RNAs that are produced that interact to control atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries. That's a very complicated system that is very liable to mutational breakage. If you break that system, you die of a heart attack. This is why we eat healthy, my friends. This is why we avoid trans fats, my friends. Just saying. But man, I know pork skins are good, but I ain't eating them. Anyway, just saying. It's not the pork, it's what it's fried in. We can also compare the genome to a computer program. But when we do, we realize that computers are very different than biology. On the left, transcription is when a cell turns DNA into RNA. And some of that RNA will be translated to protein, but transcription is the first step. Not all the RNAs are, are made into proteins, but it is taking the DNA and turning it to RNA. When we look at E. coli, we can see that there are some master level programs that control about the same number of middle level programs that control in turn a fantastic number of RNA transcripts. So every protein that this bacterium makes, an RNA has to be made to make the protein. And that's the way it's regulated. It's, it's, it's a top-down system. It's really elegant, really beautiful, and very efficient, and very compact. But we can compare that to the, what's called the call graph in Linux, the Linux operating system. And what we see is that computer programmers, after millions upon millions upon millions of hours of code writing, because you know that we're all beta testers, right? You know that? They have come up with a system with 
a lot of modules that open up a huge number of sub-modules that control a few outputs. This is incredibly inefficient, but it's the best we can do. Now, if this is the best we can do with lots of intelligent design, does this look randomly evolved to you? Or is this maybe like hyper-intelligently designed? Because I couldn't have thought of this. I couldn't program that. The best programmers in the world couldn't because this is what they do. And there it is staring us in the face. A supremely regulated, beautiful architectural system with all the hallmarks of design. Now, the second dimension contains a lot of things. Specificity, factors, enhancers, repressors, activators, transcription factors, post-transcription regulation, alternate splicing. Oh, it's crazy. Let's talk about alternate splicing. Your body, you produce probably about 300,000 different proteins. Your eyeballs produce different proteins than your liver, right? It's about 300,000 different proteins. But you only have about 19,000 protein-coding genes. I thought it was one gene and one enzyme. I thought one gene made one protein, right? Isn't that what we've been taught since the 1940s and was shrined in law in the 1960s? Well, how does your body take 19,000 genes and make 300,000 proteins? It's something called alternate splicing. This is the wrong image for that. I don't know why I have this here. What happens is this. You have a, a gene, and the gene has sections in it. And when your body makes the RNA, it cuts some sections out, throws them away, takes other sections, duplicates them, rearranges a few sections, jo joins other sections together. It'd be like having a chocolate chip cookie recipe that's also a record for, uh, recipe for rocket fuel. By deleting lines or adding lines or joining lines together, you make something completely different. That's how we work. This is not something anyone anticipated because it's a lot more complicated than anyone anticipated. And the reason for that is Darwinism has always taught us that life is simple. It's not simple. Life is incredibly complicated. I showed you this before. Oh, no, this is a different one. Here, oh, this is alternate. Okay, he's in more of the alternate splicing. This is um, alternate reading. Here's a non-protein coding area of the genome. And that area, this polymerase, can make multiple different RNAs out of it. You see how they start and stop in different places? Those are different messages. So if you mutate that one letter, you might, honestly, on average, each letter in the genome is manufactured into six different RNA messages. One of them might affect how well you see in the dark, or whether you hiccup when you eat garlic, or how tall you are. Those have nothing to do with each other, do they? And so one change can affect radically different aspects of an individual. Natural selection breaks down in that system. Natural selection needs a really clear target. This skin color affects how much stomach acid I produce. What? It does. What? So if I have a, you know, uh, if I get indigestion or if I get sunburn, which is, is natural selection going to act upon? It can't. There's no clear signal, and that's what it, that biology has taught us. Oh, this is what I was talking about. Here's a splicing code. Here's a gene, a typical gene in your body. There's double-stranded DNA. The gene is only on one of the strands. Now, there can be a gene on the other strand going the other direction. Sometimes there's genes in between these spaces, too. That's all cr crazy complicated. But upstream of the gene, there's what's called an untranslated region. This is not made into protein. But this is where the activators and repressors attach. And they tell the cell, are you going to make an RNA of this or not? But once it makes the RNA out of the whole thing, it'll stop here. We have these red things. Those are the parts that code for protein. The blue parts, those are introns, intervening sequences. They don't code for proteins. They have to be cut out and thrown away, and then the red pieces join together. But sometimes the blue thing contains an exon. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it contains an entire different gene. Sometimes it's a piece of a gene going the other direction. And this, your cell looks at these things, and there's like little signals in between, these little sequences at the, at the ends of the, each one of these things. And it will tell the cell, make this protein in this way at this stage of development under these conditions. So the same gene can make different proteins when you are growing in your mother, when you're going through puberty, and when you're almost dead. 
The same gene can make different proteins. Oh, so if a mutation happens there, which, which part of your life cycle is it going to affect? If it, if it affects only you when you're like over 50 years old? What? But basically, once you have children, you're not needed anymore. So dying of skin cancer, that's nothing that natural selection can touch because you've already had kids. Dying of a heart attack, doesn't matter. You're already old enough. You have kids. You've already reproduced. It's only things that affect reproduction that natural selection can touch. So things that affect childhood and adolescence and young adults. That's the only thing natural selection cares about. And there's so much complexity here that natural selection becomes blind. So therefore, Darwinism actually doesn't work. Okay, but that's the second dimension. We've got two more. The third dimension of the genome is the three-dimensional architecture of the genome. I can't believe you're sitting here listening to me talk about this. Some of you sitting here, why on earth did I come here? If you look at a typical chromosome, there's some sections of the chromosome. There's a, it was called a centromere of highly repetitive DNA. Then the telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes, also highly repetitive DNA, with very characteristic sequences. Then all the genes are in the arms, the short arm and the long arm. And that's basically its structure. Now, if you put that all into a cell, you think maybe they're just randomly jumbled around inside the cell. Because when we look at a microscope, they just seem to be randomly jumbled at when the cell's about to divide. But in general, the centromeres are held together and the telomeres are actually anchored to the nuclear wall. They're not random. They're spatially oriented. And so if you have a big deletion or a big inversion or a duplication in your genome, it's going to affect how these things are organized in the nucleus. So if you have DNA, yeah, um, have you ever um, had one of those balsa wood airplanes? You know what I'm talking about? It has a rubber band and you, roll, you round up the thingy and when as you turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it, all of a sudden it goes kink. Because when it's full of twists, it can't twist anymore, so it kinks. And you keep on going, you get twists of twists. And you're like, yeah, let me this thing fly 100 feet. Uh, no, you break your rubber band. <sighs> but here's the point. DNA is a, a double helix that does that. It is wrapped around proteins in your nucleus. They're called histones. And then like beads on a string, those wrap up to make a very compact structure. And eventually, they condense to the point where you can see it under a microscope. But this is twists of twists of twists of twists. And you can see... Oh, look at that, fluorescent proteins. I love my PhD work. That's not my work, but that is amazing. They can now tag individual proteins with different colors so you can see them under a microscope. That's so cool. But when they start doing this, okay, that's at one part, that's not normal. That's only at one very short stage of the cell when the proteins get lined up and the cell divides. How is it normally when the cell's not going to divide? It's like this. Each chromosome has a defined place in the nucleus. It's not random. It's organized. When they um, first sequenced the human genome, one of the first papers I read afterwards, these scientists, they looked at um, genes that are used in biochemical pathways, like that lac operon and, and E. coli. There's three genes right next to each other. They said, okay, in the human genome, this does that, and this does that, and this, and it's like five or six proteins in a row in a biochemical pathway. Let's go look for them in the genome. They predicted they'd be next to each other, because in the E. coli they are. So they said they're next to each other in the genome, and they looked, and they found out that genes that are used together are randomly spread out in the genome. And they said, oh, it's just junk. There's no rhyme or reason to it. The genes are just thrown in there and, and out of order. They're all over the place on different chromosomes. It's just, it's just millions of years of evolutionary accidents. Until they did this. And he said, oh, you know those genes that are on different chromosomes that are used, next to, they're, they're used together? They're actually next to each other in 3D space. So whoever wrote the sequence of that chromosome knew that when it folded up into 3D shape, that this gene and another gene on a different chromosome will end up right next to each other. And not only that, genes that are used together tend to be in a pocket inside the nucleus that's right next to a nuclear pore. 
So when your genes need to turn on, they all turn on at the same time. An entire biochemical pathway turns on at the same time. The messenger RNAs go out the cell, and you can make all the proteins that you need all at the same time, all at once. Because the genome is actually incredibly efficient and incredibly not junky. So they were wrong. But if you bring this up online, they will pounce on you because you're threatening their edifice. Because if the genome is not full of junk, if life is not simple, then Darwinism is not possible. The fourth dimension is time. It turns out that the DNA sequence itself changes. Your liver cells have duplicated chromosomes. One great way to increase or to, to increase your reaction rate is to give yourself more genes for doing some reaction. So your liver cells, different liver cells have different chromosomes. They have different genomes. Your brain cells, when your brain is developing um, early on, see, if I made a brain, I would lay down a sheet of tissue and then make it fatter. That's not how your brain develops. There are nerve cell proliferation spots in the, in the brain where the nerve cells are generated, and then they migrate through the brain as it develops and go to different places. And there are little pieces of DNA in, in your genome. They're called retrotransposons. They will circularize and pop out of the genome. <laughs> Life is wonderful. But they will circularize and pop out of the genome, float around someone else, and stick into another place in the genome. And very often, these, these little pieces of DNA have something that turns the gene on. So if they're not there, the gene can't turn on. If they are there, they can turn on. And your brain cells, these little retrotransposons, they jump around in your brain cell genome. So your different brain cells have actually different genomes, and different genes turn on and turned off. What? So not only does, oh, picture this. Imagine that you eat a bad peanut and you're, gonna, you're detoxifying. The aflatoxins are going to kill you. But your liver says, hey, I can, I can get rid of that toxin. Now, your kidneys don't do that. Your eyeballs don't do that. Your brain doesn't do that. But your kidney, or sorry, your liver says, I can get rid of that. I know where the gene is. And your liver finds a gene, twists around the chromosomes to expose that gene, makes a bunch of copies of that gene in terms of RNA, makes it into a protein, detoxifies that thing, and then when it's done, it folds the chromosomes up and packs it away again. That's the fourth dimension. That's a three-dimensional object changing shape in time. That is amazing. It happens over minutes. It happens during your lifetime because you don't need the same genes when you're a, a zygote as you do when you're going through puberty. I mean, you need different genes at different times. But there are so many other things. I won't even read the, the details because you get overwhelmed. And I could probably add 50 more lines to this if I wanted to. Ornish is a maverick scientist. A lot of people don't like him because he writes controversial things. But to my mind, he's amazing. This is a, a very, very interesting uh, chart. What they did is they found a whole bunch of men who had, pre, who had enlarged prostate but didn't have prostate cancer. Because you're not actually allowed to experiment on human beings. You know that, right? You're not supposed to be experiment on human beings. Um, but because they didn't actually have cancer, they took these men, they took a biopsy, and on the left, they looked at what genes were turned on and gene, what genes are turned off. Green is off, red is on. Above this line, these are happy genes. These are generic housekeeping genes that we express all the time in a happy cell. Below that are genes that are stress-related. So in these men, it's, some of them are more healthy than others, fine. But in general, they had a lot of stress-related genes turned on, and a lot of the happy genes weren't activated as much. And here's what they did. They said, okay, come back in a couple of months follow these generic diet and these generic exercise regime. And they came back and they took another biopsy and ran the study again. And look what happened. The stress-related genes turned off. The healthy, happy genes turned on. Um, we do not need any other evidence. We know exactly what controls human lifespan. Smoking will kill you. 
We know that. So will automobiles. Okay, fine. (laughs) But people, not the super athletes, they don't tend to live a long time. But people who follow generic diet and exercise, light exercise and a healthy diet, they're healthier on the inside. Okay, friends, you don't need any more information than that. You need nothing else. That's the secret to living healthy. Get your genes to turn on and turn off in the right proportions. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to live forever. No. But, okay, talking about changes in time again. We know that liver cells are different, brain cells. I've said all that already. Okay, let's do this one. What is this? Go. Please go. Go for me because you like me. Go. Okay, is that what we showed you yesterday? No, because it hasn't had a TV around it. Oh, I have a version of it without the TV. Okay, cool. So for those of you who weren't here yesterday, we'll do this again. That is DNA. Let's turn that DNA into a protein. First, we have to make a copy of the protein, a copy of the DNA in a form of RNA using a very complex machine there. It's called a ribosome. The ribosome, we're showing it magically happen, but there's, there's about 20 other proteins involved in this. It opens up the DNA. It lines up letter per letter on the DNA. It makes a copy of the DNA. So an A is copied into a, a T, and a G is copied into a C. Actually, a U, not a T. And now we have a piece of RNA. Now, if that was in you, you'd have to cut it up and re-splice it. In bacteria, they don't do this. It made this a bacterial RNA. And we're going to make that bacterial RNA into a protein using these transfer RNAs. On the bottom of these, they have a three-letter code. And those three letters will match up to three letters on the RNA inside this other, other machine. This is called a ribosome. And it works about this fast. And it literally matches them up, shoves this thing in there, and off the top, that's the amino acids that pop off to make the growing amino acid or protein chain. That's amazing. This is happening in you right now, at least a billion times right now. These other other proteins called chaperones come and glom onto that thing and prevent it from folding. And they will bring it to another, another gigantic molecule. It's a multi-protein molecule called the chaperonin. And this unfolded protein will go inside this watermelon-shaped chaperonin and get folded up into a protein. And what happened here is we started with a linear one-dimensional DNA string with a four-letter language where each word is three letters. And we're going to fold it up into a three-dimensional 20-letter language, machine, whatever you want to call that, called a protein. And that was the simplest version I could show you of this process. I mean, there's so many things we skipped over. It's shocking. You cannot have life before you have that protein. You cannot have that protein without the DNA. You can't get the protein without the copying systems that are made of proteins. You can't do any of this without ATP. That thing I showed you at the beginning, the ATP synthase motor, that was manufacturing the molecules that are used to power all of these things. But that machine's also made of protein. So what came first? The ATP synthase, the ATP, the code for these proteins in the DNA, or the machines that make the proteins that make the motor that makes the ATP that powers the machines. Yeah, good luck, Mr. Evolutionist. There's also this idea of junk DNA. Now, J.S. Maddock is a, a famous modern geneticist, and he said, the failure to recognize the full implications of this, particularly the possibility that the, now, this is junk DNA, the intervening non-coding sequences, junk DNA, the stuff that doesn't code for protein. The failure to recognize the full implication of this, particularly the possibility that the junk DNA may be transmitting parallel information in the form of RNA molecules, may well go down as one of the biggest mistakes in the history of molecular biology. I could just walk off the stage right now. The evolutionists were just wrong. We are much more complicated than they wanted to admit. So I, admit, I submit to you, the genome is a multidimensional, operating system for an ultra-complex biological computer. 
It has built-in error correction and self-modification codes. There are multiple overlapping DNA codes, RNA codes, and structural codes. There are DNA genes, there are RNA genes. It was incredibly well designed with a large amount of redundancy on purpose. Redundancy is a hallmark of design. When they launched the space shuttle, there were three primary computers on that thing. So if the first computer failed, they had a backup, and they had a backup to the backup. Anything that could be duplicated on the, on the space shuttle was. What was not duplicated? The fuel tanks on the outside, the heat tiles underneath. Those are the failing points. But anytime they could duplicate something, they did, because that's what engineers do, and that's what we see in the genome. God used sound engineering principles during its construction. And yet, despite all that redundancy, it displays an incredible degree of compactness. Because only about 20,000 protein coding genes create over probably about 300,000 different proteins. So, I have a challenge for the evolutionists. This is a quote from Charles Darwin. Now, this has been very abused. I only use this with a caveat here. He said... This, and then he followed up by trying to explain the origin of the eye. He said it keeps him awake at night, and then he ex- tried to come up with this evolutionary thing. So he said this, and he, he thinks he can explain it, but he really can't. He said this, if it could ever be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which cannot possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Well, Mr. Darwin, welcome to the 21st century. Your theory has absolutely broken down. My retort is, I claim the genome could not have arisen through natural processes. And hey, Darwin, give us a workable scenario, including the source of the informational changes, the account of an amount of the mutation necessary, a description of selective forces. I'll even give you millions of years because I know you can't do it. Once you have life, life can be modified. You can't get life from scratch. It requires a designer. Period. Now, again, a lot of this has appeared in the pages of Creation Magazine. I want to give you an opportunity now. To exp- I want to explain to everyone at once so you know what, what's going on here. I would love for you to sign up for Creation Magazine. In fact, uh, grandmas, moms, imagine your children's delight if they got a glossy science magazine in the mail that had their name on it. If I was that kid, oh, man, I would tear that thing open and I would read, 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 read. Now, a lot of people don't have print magazines anymore. Well, we have a digital version also. You sign up for the print magazine. We will give you an email. Every time it comes out, it comes out four times a year. There'll be a link in the email. Click on the email, and it'll open up. I've, I've read Creation Magazine flying across an ocean on my phone. So it works great. That's there for you. But for a two-year subscription, I'm also going to include two documentaries. One is called Darwin, the Voyage that Shook the World. We spent about a million dollars on this. For Charles Darwin's 200th birthday, we went all around the world chasing Charles Darwin's footsteps. And we interviewed a bunch of evolutionists. We went to Galapagos Islands. We went up, up and down South America. We went to his home in England. Um, it was, it's a really interesting documentary because you can't understand evolution without understanding that man. And that man is not the man that the media has portrayed. He wasn't some happy person. No, he was a miserable, suffering individual. In fact, um, he was agoraphobic. He would never go outside in a crowd. He had a mirror at the end of the... His older brother was a drug addict, so they pensioned him off, and Darwin inherited all the family money. Anyway, he'd be sitting in his study with his doors cracked, looking down the mansion's corridor, and there was a full-length mirror just inside the front door. And when the door opened, he could look up and see the mirror. If it was an unannounced visitor, he'd run away. Yeah, that's the man who started evolution. We need to understand him. I'm also going to throw in, a, it's about a 35-minute documentary called Fallout. We went around to college campuses and interviewed hundreds of students and asked them, hey, what's, yeah, first we asked them, did you go to church growing up? If they said yes, we said, all right. Were you ever taught anything about creation or evolution? And then we said, do you still go to church? Wow, they said the most interesting things. Take out all the swear words, and we had a really good documentary. And it's, it's actually a genius production. It's about, only about 35 minutes long. It's quirky. It's fun. But you can get that with a, a two-year subscription for the magazine. Here's what the sign-up form looks like. Check off one year or two year. It'll be going around. It'll probably be going around while we're doing a Q&A after this also. But just look at it. On the back is a place you can give a gift subscription to somebody. Now, on the table, 
the high-tech cell, very similar to what I just presented to you, if you want to see it again or share it with somebody. But also, because a lot of people don't have DVD players, the DVD has a QR code on it, and any modern phone, if you hover over it, it'll bink, and you click on it, and it'll go straight to CMI's web store, and it will load that for free into your account. And so you can watch it. And after you do that, give the DVD to somebody else. Fine enough. That's there. That works great. Um, Evolution's Achilles Heel, the book, the documentary. We're talking about high, powerful stuff here. A lot of the things we do are like on an eighth grade level, and we have a bunch of kids' books. But this is like upper high school, college level on purpose. Sorry, guys, I forgot to say. Yes, you can do that. Appreciate that. So these materials are there for you. And the reason I brought the books and things is because I'm going to go away. I can't tell you everything. I can't tell you everything I know. You wouldn't want to know everything I know. You're interested in other things. It was a huge selection of things answering tons of questions. And we believe they're faith-affirming things, and they're there for you. And as we break into Q&A time, I'm going to leave up 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's in you. You do it with gentleness and respect. Why gentle and why respectful? Because trying to emulate Christ, it's hard. Man, when I get insulted, my Irish temper flares up. I want to punch someone in the nose. But I can't do that. I'm not allowed in Christ to have that reaction. So i got to suck it up uh, and give an answer. Now, I don't expect you to do that, but okay. I have 8.03 on my clock. I like doing short Q&As because, you know, people get antsy. So who's got a, who in the front row here has, has a watch? Anybody? Oh, yes? Yes? Okay. At 8.15, do this.